the second book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 2 from verse 1. And yesterday we saw the uh, problem that the Amalekite had who brought the news of King Saul's death to David. And we continue, verse 1, And it came to pass after this that David inquired of Yahuwah, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? So again, we see the example in David's life, always going to the Father, always taking all his human problems. We've got so many. Oh, we've got so many human problems. And can we really take all of it to Abba? Of course we can. We see the example in David's life. Um, and Yahuwah said unto him, Go up. So I wish Yahuwah can speak to us like this. Um, but I remember that in Hebrews 1 verse 1, it does say that in the times past, God spoke through his prophets. But in these days, he's speaking to us through his son, which is his word, which is his word. So we also go to him. Sometimes he answers us in strange ways, sometimes through the word, sometimes through just getting peace about a decision that you have to make. And sometimes, you know, each one of us has a, a witness of how Yahuwah has answered us in our lives. But David has always goes to Yahuwah because he's afraid now. Remember, he's been hunted by the men of Judah. The men of Judah in Jerusalem and all the men of Israel were the soldiers of King Saul. And now King Saul is dead. Is David still hunted? Or is David now finally going to be accepted by the people in Jerusalem? Will they finally stop hunting him now, now that Saul and all his hypocrisy and all his, um, you know, paranoia is no longer there? So shall I go into any of the cities of Judah? And Jehovah said to him, go up. And David said, and David said, well, it wasn't good enough just for David to get a partial answer from Yahuwah. Can I go up? Yes, you can go up. But where exactly do you want me to go? And I wonder if we can do this in our lives as well. Shall I do this thing? Yes, you shall. But what exactly must I do? And I know many of us can complain that God doesn't answer us. But a witness from our own life is if I look at all the options there are, and then I bring them to Father. He doesn't tell me, oh, choose option A or option B. You know, it's just as time progresses and as I make my own decisions and as I use my logical brain and I choose option B, for instance, and all the doors are closed, then me and my husband have told Father Yahuwah, we, it took us almost a year to find a piece of land to finally buy after we've been disappointed with three previous buys. And it came to the point where we thought maybe, point where we thought maybe, you know, all the doors are closed for us. Maybe God doesn't want us to leave the city and come live on a farm. Or maybe he doesn't want us to live in this area. We don't know. So all the doors were closing. Every single door, wherever we turned, wherever, whatever we tried, all the doors were just banging in our face. And eventually we said to him, we can see all the doors are closing. And that is good. We are not angry, we are not, we are a little bit depressed, but we're bringing our depression to you and we understand that whatever your choice is, we will experience and understand your decision in the doors that are closing for us. So we realize that there's no options left, we have come to the end of all our efforts and we didn't know what else to do. If, there's actually a beautiful witness in this, but I'm not going to tell you everything, but I promise you. It wasn't long after that, and then a door opened. And I promise you, the door, promise you, the door that opened was a million times better than the previous three doors that closed. And we are just, we were just amazed. We, we wanted to fall off our chairs because we accepted all the closed doors and we waited for him to show us. We, we don't know what to do anymore. We've tried everything. Obviously, um, option B, C, and D wasn't the right one. So we don't know what to choose anymore. We're going to leave it up to you. And I promise you, he opened the door. And today we have a farm in the mountains, far away from the cities, um, a much more logistically uh, better located. Um, everything is here that we need. And, you know, almost for the kind of money we, was, we would have spent on the other pieces of land where there was absolutely nothing. So we've learned a very hard lesson. 
to never give up. up. When all the doors are closing, just continue doing what your um, what your hand finds to do. When the door closes, don't give up. It's just God showing you, this is not where you must go, David. I don't want you to go into any city. God answered him and said, I want you to go to Hebron specifically. So if he had gone to, if he didn't ask you who are which city and he had gone to a couple of different cities, the doors would have closed until he came to Hebron and there the door would have been opened. And Hebron in the um, Hebrew is Hebron. And Hebron, amazingly enough, means a seat of association or a company or a company that is associated with one another wide. So isn't that beautiful? The king, the shepherd king, comes to Hebron where the two houses, the house of Jehated, with each other, must form one company. And of course, we cannot do any different than to always go to the prophets. Ezekiel 37. Where's Ezekiel now? Daniel, Ezekiel 37, verse 22. So Ezekiel 7, verse 22, talks about our king, the Messiah, that is typified in the king David. Because verse 22 says, Neither shall they defile themselves, no, that's verse 23, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountain of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. They shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms kingdoms any more at all. So Hebron or Hebron, where David became the king of the where David became the king of the house of Judah, and later on uh, over the entire house of Jacob, including the ten northern tribes, the house of Israel, David typifies the Messiah who will bring the Jew and the Messianic and all the Gentiles who turn back and are grafted into the olive tree. He will make them one nation again on the mountains of Israel, just like we see here. Don't go to any city. I want you to go to the city that is called the seat of association because you, David, my beloved, you shepherd boy, whom I have anointed Moshiach to become king, you will be the one king over the one nation of Israel, the house of Jacob. Jacob's name changed to Israel. So David went up to Hebron, him and his two wives, Ahinoman and Ahinoam, the, Yisra, the Yisrael, Lytus. She's from, Jes- she's from Jezreel. And Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him, did David bring up with him to Hebron, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. So again, these 600 men with their families, makes me think of the 600,000 men with their families coming out of Egypt. Isn't that amazing? 600,000. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were these men here, and they buried Saul. So David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed are you of Yahuwah, that you showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and you've buried him after everything Saul has done to David. David. David honors Saul. And the man that came to tell David about Saul's death, the man that gleed over the fact that he actually killed Saul, David killed him. But the men that risked their lives to go fetch the bodies of Saul and his sons, David is blessing now. He's honoring them because they honored King Saul. What a, what a um, character this David has. I don't know if I have this kind of character. Let's be honest. I don't know. And now Yahuwah show kindness and truth unto you. And also I will repay you this kindness because you have done this kind thing for your King David. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened and be valiant for your master Saul is dead 
and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. But your king is dead now. God has anointed me. And if you want, you can join forces with me. I bless you. I welcome you. I'm not going to give you any trouble because you were loyal to Saul. No, because I know that you are loyal men. It's not that you were against me because you were loyal to Saul. You were just loyal to the crown. So, so come and join me now and be loyal to me. I'm wearing the crown now. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim. And um, Abner made Ishbosheth, one of the kings of one of the sons of Saul that wasn't uh, with him in battle, made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all of Israel. So there was a time. There was a time that David was only king over the tribes of Judah. And then Abner made a descendant of King Saul, the king over all the other tribes and all the other areas. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned for two years. But the house of Judah followed David. Very prophetic. Oh, it's so amazingly prophetic because Ishbosheth in the Hebrew means Man of shame, man of confusion. Ish is man, and Boshet is shame and confusion. So, for two years, and again we see, as we discussed, you know, one day is like a thousand years. For for two years, Ish Boshet, the man of confusion, the Babylonian Luciferian Examperian example. The prophetic explanation of the Antichrist system is ruling and reigning over all the tribes. And yet, King David is reigning over Judah. Because we see in all the Bible, and you've done all these studies with me, how Judah, although some of them became the Jews of the synagogue of Satan and rules the world, but most of the common men of Judah, have kept the Torah over the last 2,000 years, while the Christians became totally Torahless. And now Ishbosheth, the man of shame, the man that came to confuse the world through the whole Roman Catholic false doctrine system that you are no longer um, required to be obedient to the covenant, is ruling this world. And the Bible says 10 men will grab onto the skirt of a Jew and tell him, we know that God is with you. Teach us the ways. Teach us the ways of God. We want to learn from you. But unfortunately, like with Abner, who doesn't trust King David, he in, he knows King David was even fighting with him next to next to his side in the battles. He can trust David, but he's still so loyal, and he wants to make sure that his position in the kingdom is secured. So he's not sure that David is going to just allow him to come in. So he's going with an alternative and he brings in the alternative one. The serpent, Satan, is the alternative one with the second kingdom that rules and reigns. And yes, he's taken over the house of Judah as well. But in the prophetic, in the mystery, we can see how the Messiah has actually been in the Torah. The Jews don't know that, but they've been kept keeping the, the Torah for the last 2,000 years. While well, we have followed the man of confusion, Babylon, false doctrines, mixed religion. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servant of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahaniam to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruah, and the servant of David went out, and they met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So here we've got two strong um, military men, Abner and Joab, both of them representing their king, both of them being leaders in their different kingdoms. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, let them arise. Then there arose and went over by number 
twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and twelve of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. So, twelve men from Abner's side, from Saul's son, Ishbosheth's side, and twelve, son, uh, twelve young men from David's side, from Job's side, are coming now to play. They call it play in verse 11. And they caught everyone his fellow by the, by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together. Wherefore the place was called Halkath Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. Ah. All right, so, you know, be careful when, when two leaders, two military leaders tell you that you need to come and play. Because the playing from verse 14 is actually the thrusting through of verse 16. Where they meant, let, the, let 12 men from my side and 12 men from your side, let them play out a battle. Let them fight battle. Let them fight against each other. Let's see which side is strongest. But unfortunately, you know, of both the 12 men from the one side and the 12 men from the other side, at the same time, grabbed the man opposite of him by his hair and thrust his sword through his side. So simultaneously, they all killed each other. And the place was called Helkath Hazurim. It means in Hebrew, smoothness of the rocks. Smoothness, um, I don't know. Helkath and Tzur brings you Hazurim. Smoothness of the stone, smoothness of the boulder, of the rock, of the refuge. Uh, yeah, when all the men died there, I'm not sure why they called it smoothness of the rock. But maybe some of you can figure it out. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten, beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. So who was eventually the strongest? strongest? On the side of David, Joab and his men from Judah was stronger than Abner and his men from Israel. And there were the three sons of Zeruah there, Joab, Abishai, and Azahel. And Azahel was as light of foot. <coughs> oh, well, sorry. And Azahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. So these three sons of Zeruah were now the three leaders, the three mighty men, the valiant men, the heroes. We will learn a lot about these three men that really followed David. Like uh, Revelation says, the 144,000 servants of uh, Yahuwah follow the Lamb wherever he goes. So these three were very loyal to David. And one of them, Azahel, was as light-footed. You know, he was so far, he was so quick, quick, quick on his feet as a young um, antelope. All right? And Azahel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand, not to the left, from following Abner. So Abner was running away for his life, and Azahel was um, pursuing him. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Are you Azahel? <laughs> so, are you Azahel? Because he's running. He, he knows he's running for his life. If Azahel catches him, he's going to flip and kill him. So, is it you, Azahel? And Azahel answered, Yes, it's me. And Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right or to your left and lay hold of one of the young men and take you his armor. But Azahel would not turn aside from following him. So it's interesting. Abner is trying to deceive or deceive or delay or get Azahel from being scared because he, who's Abner, is a tough soldier. He's an older man. He's got lots of experience. And maybe he's trying to scare Azahel to say, um, at least get yourself some, um, some gear um, to protect yourself. Get yourself um, some armor. Almost like Saul, who told David, put on my armor, go into battle with my plans. But David wanted to go into battle with God plan, with only God's plans. All right, so what we are seeing here, the name Azahel, Azahel is Azahel. It means to be like Al, to be 
to, to have the same thoughts, the same ideas, the same desires, the same covenant, the same character, the same um, goals, goals like Yahuwah. So Azahel wasn't willing to be destroyed or to be deterred by influence from somebody like Abner who refuses God's kingdom to be won under King David, his anointed. So if we are the other house of this world and we also refuse to accept the serpents and all the puppets of the serpents who is trying to, to stop the restoration of the kingdom of David that we learned about in Ezekiel 37 verse 2 where God says one king will be over my nation and my nation will become one and they will no longer be divided. This was the plan under King David and Abner was not going for this. You know many people that doesn't want to accept this. You know of many people that believes there's only a New Testament church and the church and then the old Jews with their Torah. But there's restoration all throughout Old and New Testament being preached by God, Yeshua, every prophet, every disciple, and the apostles. And all of them want the restoration to happen between the two houses. They want Hebron, the association and the one company, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the company where, where you gather together as a group, you're a company. And God, Al, wants that. He wants his nation to become one again. And if we are like Azahel, we will continue running. Like God said um, to Joshua, here's my Torah. Do not go to the left or to the right, but stay on this way that I give you. So Azahel is staying on the way. He's not going to the left. He's not going to the right. Abner, serpent, and um, false prophets, you can all go to hell. We are not going to turn to the Lishua, which is the living Torah alone, even if it costs us our life. Azahel did not turn aside from following Abner. And Abner said to Azahel, turn aside from following me. Wherefore will I kill you? How then should I hold up my face to Joab, your brother? So Abner didn't really want to kill Azahel because he knew Joab. They fought in wars together. And Abner didn't want to face Joab if he had to kill Azahel, his brother. How about Azahel refused to turn to a side? Wherefore Abner, with the, with the back part, the end of the spear, smote Azahel, Azahel, sorry, Azahel, under the fifth rib, so that the spear came out behind him, and Azahel fell down there and died in the same place, died in the same place. Aye, and it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Azahel fell down they and died, they stood still. So here we can see that eventually Abner did kill Azahel, and he killed him by thrashing a spear into his side, into his ribs, just like Yeshua, who is the one who is like El. He kept on coming after Satan to destroy sin and to help us be released from the kingdom of darkness. And as Genesis 3.15 says, he will go through something that might you know, like uh, Genesis 3 verse 15 says, um, the serpent will bite you in your heel. But Genesis 5 also talks about the blessed God will come down teaching that his death will bring the, the despairing rest. And many other, Isaiah 53, and many other verses that says, when this one who's like El will follow behind the one that has brought the man of confusion and the confusion into this world so that the two houses of God's kingdom cannot be restored. He will pay with his life. Yes, we know Yeshua rose on the third day, but just like Azahel, a spear was thrust into the side of Yeshua and he died. And everyone for the last 2,000 years that comes to the cross and see where Yeshua has died, we also, like the people in verse 
23, we stand still and we look at Yeshua and we understand he died so that the two houses can be restored again. And one king.